So we're about to transition to a new set of topics. We're going to be talking about synchronizers. We've talked about concurrency in the abstract and the concepts of concurrency. We've talked about parallelism in the abstract and concepts of parallelism. We've talked a bit about concurrency mechanisms in Java. We talked about parallelism mechanisms in Java. Won't say too much more about the parallelism mechanisms in this course. And now we're ready. And we've also talked extensively about threads. Now we're going to shift our focus to synchronization. And that will help you with assignment 1B, which will be out soon. But in order to do this properly, we have to talk about the Java memory model first. So what is the Java memory model? Uh, the Java memory model is a document. It's part of the Java specification. You can read more about it here. I'll give you a link to the specification itself later. And it basically describes the semantics or the meaning of multi-threaded access to shared memory in Java programs. And this is kind of the way things look in modern computer systems. You have some main memory. You have some processor cores, each of which has its own cache. Each processor core has its own cache. And then you have threads that, of course, run on the processor cores. And as they do work, typically they will be storing, reading and writing data from the cache. That's very important to remember. Without doing some additional work, things get stored in the cache. And that, of course, has some blessings and some curses. The blessings of storing things in caches is that for most programs, especially single-threaded programs, your code is just so much faster because reading and writing from a cache is way faster than going to main memory. Main memory is pretty fast, too, relative to reading and writing to some kind of disk or flash. But but cache is really fast. So some of the things that happen behind the scenes that you never really see is that modern processors at the hardware level and other levels as well try to be clever about reordering the instructions to make things run as fast as possible. And for sequential programs, it doesn't really matter as long as the appearance to you is that everything ran in the order that it shows in the, the text in the program. You don't really care the actual order of the instructions as long as you get the effective result. You get a result that is meaningful based on kind of a review of the source code. So as a consequence, left to the own devices, hardware will rearrange things. And, and basically what that means is things will be stored up in caches. And then they'll be written and read from the caches in chunks to try to maximize the performance of the overall system. And this works fine for sequential code, but it causes chaos and insanity for concurrent programs without taking advantage of synchronization. That's, that's where we're headed with all this. And the Java memory model defines these things, these semantics of the memory model, to maximize behavior on modern processors while making sure that you can enforce ordering when you need to. And we'll talk about when you need to do that. So here are some of the different sources of reordering. The Java compiler can reorder things. The just-in-time compiler can reorder things. The processor instruction pipelines can reorder things. The instruction caches can reorder things. You can get reordering all over the place. By the way, what's a just-in-time compiler? Does anybody know what a just-in-time compiler is? Yeah, great. You're, you're on the right track. So, so in the normal compiler, what, what does a normal Java compiler do on most systems? What is it? But what does the compiler do? Yeah. Right. So the Java compiler produces what's called bytecode. And the Java compiler produces Java bytecode. Um, so that Java bytecode is then taken at runtime and, quote, interpreted by an interpreter. And a just-in-time compiler, as, as you alluded to, takes a look at the bytecode as it's running and does some further optimizations as the code is about to run. So it's just in time. And it converts it into typically into native code at that point. And then that native code is executed. And that would conceivably run faster. And some virtual machines try to be very clever. And this is really what you're talking about. By looking at code that runs frequently, like say in a loop, and then does a just-in-time compiler optimization on that so that that code will run faster. Now, there's modern, more modern Java compilers called ahead-of-time compilers or way-ahead-of-time compilers, 
watts, way ahead of time compiler, or watts. Um, and the way ahead of time compiler actually generates native code from the Java code. And Android, in more recent versions with the Android runtime, has an ahead of time compiler that actually compiles it into native code. And there's all kinds of trade offs, pros and cons. In a general rule, moving to an ahead of time compiled model is probably going to give you faster code than doing a just in time compiler. But they're, they're pros and cons. Um, so those are places things get reordered. That's what a just in time compiler is. Let's take a look at an example that will help illustrate instruction orderings and the, the dangers therein with uh, concurrent programs. So here we have some static variables, x and y, and we're going to assign them to 0. So x and y both start out in, with the value 0. And then thread t1, or thread 1 gets created, thread 2 gets created, and thread 1 is going to assign the value of x to 1, and thread 2 will assign the value of y to 1. OK, so far so good. And let's assume, just for sake of argument, that both of these things run at the same time. In, in real life, they probably wouldn't execute at the same time, but let's say that they do. So over here, we're going to set j to the value of y, and we're going to set i to the value of x. So let's say, for sake of argument, i and j are local variables in, in some method running in thread 1 and thread 2. What do you think the value of j and i are going to be after this code runs? Well, you're right. You have the faintest idea. The fact that nobody knew is a good thing, because you don't have any idea. And the reason for this, of course, is because the compiler can end up reordering these things such that y will still have the value of 0 in this thread, because over here, when this thread wrote to y, it might have written it to a local cache and not written it to the main memory. So this could still be 0 by the time it reads it, because it hasn't gotten propagated through the memory hierarchy to show up in thread 1's instruction cache on the processor core it's running on. So because of these local caching effects, it could end up that i equals 0 and, and j equals 0, even though the values have been set to 1. Well, that's a little bit peculiar. And that, if you aren't aware of this, you could write code that was full of bugs that would sometimes have 1, sometimes have 0. The, the formal fancy name for that is it's non-deterministic. We don't know what it's going to be. So, and the, the Java Virtual Machine specification says that a perfectly legitimate implementation of the Java threading model with its memory model is, is free to end up with these results if you don't take steps to make them synchronized. You don't take steps to make sure that the memory is, is ordered in a way that's consistent. Um, the specification also says a few other things. Um, so here we're going to do something like this, and you can read the specification for more about this stuff. So here, once again, we have x and y, and um, here we're going to say, you know, r1 equals x, r2 equals y. Over here, we're going to set y equal to r1, and down here, we're going to set equal to r2. And the specification says you can't randomly reorder things to the point where the results make no sense. <laughs> so you don't want to have a situation where you're going to reorder them and you end up with some bizarre result. The results are 42, right? That would be bizarre. So the results have to be something sensible, but they don't have to be what you think they would be just by looking at the code statically and in a totally linear way. So the specification tries to explain the semantics of these mechanisms. Now, it turns out that reading the Java specification for a memory model is really, really boring. This is important for people writing virtual machines. This is important for people writing compilers. This is important for people writing libraries like the Java Util Concurrent Library. But it is not the least bit edifying. So the good news is that you don't have to understand all the mechanisms of the Java memory model. Thank goodness, because your life would be horrible. You as a programmer, you as an application developer, even a systems developer, don't have to understand all these details typically. You just have to understand how to use the various synchronizers. 
And as long as you know how to use the synchronizers, which are much more intuitive in a lot of ways, they take care of all the memory model issues under the hood. And it's only when you need to be very, very clever and very, very cute that you have to care about this kind of stuff. Now, the people who wrote the synchronizers had to know about all these things. And if you read the Java code, there'll be places where your mind will explode. If you don't know the Java memory model, you'll be like, what the heck is that doing? But once you use the synchronizers, which we will cover in great detail, then luckily all this stuff is done for you. And, and the synchronizers we're going to cover are mutual exclusion, coordination, atomicity, and barrier synchronization. And you will see these little icons show up over and over again because they're kind of funny. All right, so that's the overview of the Java memory model. The good news is you, you're obliged to be aware it exists and you're obliged to know synchronizers so you don't have to know what it says. And that's about what you need to know.